And I'm thankful for you being here. And, and as we start our time together, I kind of want you to take yourself back about 2,000 years. And I want to paint this picture for you as I take yourself back some 2,000 years and, and, and that and, and kind of think being in this, this little community of this happening as you, as you hear this guy talk and that and, and, and stuff. But see, I'll be honest with you. that When I see you walking down the street, I made it a point to look down. Actually, to be honest with you, a lot of times when I see her coming down the street, if I could possibly do it, I cross the other side because I didn't want to have anything to do with her, you know? And I was part of the ones that were making the snickering and the snide remarks. But it wasn't just me. It was all the other guys in the community as well. And what did she expect? I mean, I didn't make the choices. None of us made the choices that she made. I didn't run from one relationship to the next like, it, you know, or some blowout sale on Black Friday uh, and that. And, and it wasn't all the time that we mocked her and that and she mostly kept to herself you know and whatever her flavor of the month husband or boyfriend was and and it wasn't like when she was walking down and saw us it wasn't like she said anything to us that's why it was so crazy on this one day when she came running into the center of the town yelling and screaming for people to come follow her for people that they had to come and follow her i mean i was thinking to myself what's gotten into this woman you know where did this sudden urgency come from that all of a sudden people had to start listening to her, people had to start paying attention to her, and people had to start following her. So kind of out of sheer curiosity and intrigue, I, I decided with some other people to go ahead and, and to follow her, you know, and, and, and we did, and we walked out, and we went to the well that people, the ladies in our town, and that, the well that we used that we went out to just about every single morning, but it wasn't the well that was the thing, it was the person that was standing next to the well, and when we got there, she said, okay, 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 everybody, I want you to understand. And, and she kind of moves to the side. She goes, this is the person right here. This is the guy, Jesus. He's the one I told you that said everything about me, knew everything about me. This is the guy I want you to listen to. She stepped out of the way, and this guy named Jesus started teaching. And he started to teach and say things in ways that I'd never, ever heard before. Crowds were listening. Crowds were in awe. And, I mean, everybody was just celebrating, getting excited. That day, I gave my life to Jesus. I mean, it was the best decision I had ever, ever made. And there's been many, many times on that I think to myself, what if she had never came and told us? What if she hadn't invited me to come out to the well that day and meet this guy named Jesus? I don't look down when I pass anyone on the road anymore. Morning, church. Glad you're here with us, and, and, and that can be here. So we're continuing in with the series of, you know, what is my purpose? We've said that it doesn't matter whether you're Christian or not. Everybody wants to know that their life has meaning and value and worth, that they're contributing, that they have some kind of purpose that they're supposed to be here for. And when we look through scriptures, when we study scriptures, and that we actually find out that Jesus created us all with a purpose. And when we started this series off, we said that every single one of us is called. It's not just the paid staff that are supposed to do ministry. and that. But anybody who says, yes, I'm a believer, I'm a follower, or I'm a Christian, we're all supposed to be out doing ministry. We all have a mission to fulfill. And so the second week we gathered together, we tried to answer the question, okay, if that's the case, then what is my mission? What is the mission I'm supposed to, what is the purpose I'm supposed to be fulfilling? And in a nutshell, we said our mission is Jesus' mission to grow in this relationship with God and introduce him to others. And last week we said, okay, then how do we actually introduce him? And we tried to answer the question, what's my message then? If I have this purpose that I'm supposed to be about and this mission that I'm supposed to be fulfilling, then while I'm out doing this, what's the message that I'm supposed to be delivering? And we learned that it's simply sharing with others how the goodness of God has intersected our life. And so today as we gather and today as we continue on, we're going to try to answer the question, then who is my mission? If that's the message of my mission, then who is my mission? And, and I think a lot of us can say, well, yeah, Dave, I get it. I get that I'm supposed to share, you know, how good God's, or how God's goodness has intersected with my life. But are you asking me just to kind of walk up to a total random stranger, tap them on the shoulder, go door to door knocking with, and don't know these people or whatever and, 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 and start talking to them? Is that what you're asking? Well, that's what I want us to unpack today. That's what I want us to look at today, and that's what I want us to identify today. And if you're here still trying to figure out this whole Jesus, God, church thing, I'm glad you're here. 
uh, you know, you're always welcome uh, with that and to be here with us as you're trying to figure this aspect out. And, and it's, it's a good thing because if you're trying to figure out, do I really want to be this follower? Do I really want to walk with Christ? This hopefully as you sit and as you listen and as you hear this, it'll help you understand what it really means, what Jesus is asking of you. And if you're here and you say, I am a follower, of course, I'm glad you're here also. But uh, I think this, this is a major thing, that a major theme that, that we need to be reminded of in our life, you know, because I, I think if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, and if we ignore what we're going to be learning about today, I think it's really going to be very difficult for us to fulfill the purpose for which we've been created for. In John 2, uh, 24 and 25, it says this, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. You see, Jesus knows us. Jesus knows people. He knows what's in them. And as he started his ministry, he gives us two what I would call polar opposite examples of the kinds of people that he is willing to use and to work through to accomplish his ministry. In John 3, 1, it says this. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So Jesus starts this conversation with this religious man. Many of you may have heard of him named Nicodemus. And we're not going to look and study the conversation today except to say that the author, John, I believe very deliberately, deliberately, not deliberately, but deliberately placed it before, you know, the scene that we are going to look at today. See, Christ comes and he has this spiritual conversation with this religious leader named Nicodemus. And you would think in this conversation that he's talking to this guy, that this guy would know better, that this guy would have all the religious answers like your pastor. You know, but you find in this conversation, he's actually having to correct Nicodemus on some very basic issues. And I think one of the things that we have to understand is that just because someone may appear to be super Christian, I guess if you could put it that way, it doesn't mean that they're still not struggling with questions of their own faith. And so the Jesus goes from this conversation with this leader, Nicodemus, and and comes into this other conversation with this woman, and they couldn't be further apart on the spiritual spectrum scale scale, than when it comes to where they are in their walk and their belief in Christ. And I think Christ is making a profound point that nobody is off limits when it comes to telling them and talking and sharing with them about who God is. So we pick up the one we're going to look at in John chapter 4. The very beginning, we read this. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, geography can help us understand this passage a little bit. You're going to see a map come up on your screen there. When you take a look, you look at the bottom, you see Judea, the area of Judea. That's, that's where they're at. That's where we're reading that they're starting here. And Jesus, all the way to the top, you see Galilee. That's where he wants to go back to. His journey is getting ready to go back to. But in between there, you'll see the area of Samaria. And right down there, you'll see the car that's right there with that. And so that Samaria, that area, you can look at that as like, well, you know, that's Sagamon County type of area. And, and I'm sure you've probably heard teachings uh, when it comes to how the Jews looked at or how the Jews treated the Samaritans and what the Jewish people thought of the Samaritans. They didn't like them at all. They thought that they, you know, they despised them because they saw them as sellouts. Because these were, the Jew, these were Jews that had intermarried over time with the people of the land, and they were half Jewish and quarter Jewish and all of that. And so the Jewish people despised and hated to the point when you look at that map they would take a day or two to go around Samaria because they would not even touch their feet on the dust and the dirt of the Samaritans that was classified it's like Williamsville say we had this rival against Athens in football okay and that you have to pretend you know that we have this rival and and Williamsville hated Athens so much that if we were going to go that way on the city limits we would go around in the cornfields or whatever there was no way we would ever set foot in those Athenites, you know, how dare we, you know, and that kind of stuff. And that's how they're looking at it here. That's what's happening right here. But Jesus actually went out of his way to go through Samaria from the standpoint as well, it looks like it's a straight shot. It's going out of his way because probably doesn't say what the conversation was with the disciples. But remember, these disciples are 12 Jewish men that he's working with. 
and how they're being raised. And so it's interesting that he goes through this. And, and, and we pick up, we continue with our story in, in verse 7 of John 4 when it says this. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So this morning, as we try to unpack and we try to answer the question, then, who is my mission? It's interesting how people, a couple people here, viewed this woman. I mean, the woman herself, when, when she was standing there, in the scripture, what did she say? How did she identify herself to Jesus? I am a what? Not just a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman. You know, standing at the well, probably, I mean, Jesus probably had some pretty good eyes. He could probably distinguish that this was a woman standing there. She didn't need to clarify that, but yet she did. You know, she clarified two things. Number one, you're a man, you're a Jew, you're talking to me, a Samaritan that is a woman. Why, you know, from that aspect? You could see how she's already placing herself in that culture. And then on top of it, she's at the well at noon, when most people came out in the morning in the cooler hours. Why is she by herself at noon? Because people in the community, she knew what they thought of her. She knew what they thought of her life choices and how she was living her life and what that. And so it was just easier for her to come out at her time and her way. And so she comes out. I'm sure she has this guilt. I'm sure she sees herself with shame. She's a Samaritan woman. And how about the disciples? Well, Dave, the disciples weren't there. Oh, yeah, I know they weren't there, you know, and, and stuff. But think about this. The disciples, Jesus comes to the well, and Jesus sends the disciples on the trail to go in town to get food, Correct. And as they're going in town to get food on that trail, who's coming out on that trail to get water? Possibly the woman. I don't know if they made it to town before she came out on the trail. I have no idea when it came to that aspect, but it's very likely they could have crossed paths, you know, when it came to that aspect. It doesn't mention anything that was said to them or was said there with it. And how about Jesus himself? How did he see her? He saw her as a woman of worth, a woman that was worth going out of his way, a woman that was worth crossing the social barriers for. And, you know, she was pretty persistent. Starting in verse 15, it says this, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She's still not quite getting it, is she? He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have uh, just said is quite true. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I know in my time in, in, in ministry and, and that uh, I've heard people teach on this and preach on this and, and talk about this. And, and a lot of the times, the things that they talk about, you know, is the woman's sinfulness, the woman's shame, and, and, and that aspect that was there. And, and I understand that's part of this. But that, that, I don't think that's all that's there. And I don't know that she's gotten a fair shake. You know, yes, part of her story is a lot of things from her past that she wasn't proud of and she made some decisions. But again, uh, you know, I said, let's go back 2,000 years. Let's go back to this time, you know, in this first century Middle East culture. It was extremely a man-centered world. And to be honest, if you go to the Middle East culture, there's some of it that's still extremely man-centered. But definitely back then, very man-centered. Women were seen as second, if even third class. Men had all the power. It was completely acceptable for a man to have several premarital uh, sexual relationships. And, and you know, if in a marriage and if a man, if he wanted to divorce his wife, if he didn't like her for whatever reason, you know, and she didn't make him the coffee the right way, didn't bring him donuts before her Sabbath, you know, or I don't know, if, for whatever reason he could come up with, he just had to write her certificate of divorce and she's thrown out on the street. And for a woman to be without a man, without children and boys and stuff like that, that was an extremely bad place back then for them to be. So just maybe just maybe when it comes to that this woman isn't some kind of woman that maybe a lot of the times we picture today in our mind 
you know, this, this whatever you would call her, prostitute or whatever that just jumps around from guy to guy. Maybe this was a woman who had been used and abused over and over by multiple men. And she knows what it's like to feel pain and loss. You know, maybe even carrying some bitterness and anger along with her guilt and shame that we talked about before. But yet, here she is. She doesn't give up. She's still going. You know, she's still day after day going out to the well, getting the water. I think everybody missed something that Jesus saw because, as always, he knows, he sees, he understands the heart. He saw what was inside of her. And, and, and I love, I think this is one of the best parts here, skipping all the way down to verse 39 of John chapter 4. It said this. It says this. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the, women's, the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So this very next text is talking about he's going to head up there. You know, we saw on that map he's going to head up to Galilee. and that. But there's this impromptu spiritual revival that breaks out. Why? Why? How does it happen? Because the very woman that people cast aside. The very woman that people smirked at. The very woman that people the very woman that people looked down upon, whatever ridiculed and everything had rejected. The very that very woman convinces them, comes back into that community and convinces them to come out and meet her new friend, come out and meet the Savior, Jesus. And I'm sure because of who she was, it couldn't have been easy. You know, I'm sure she had to do some pleading with people to come. And I'm sure not the whole community at once came. I mean, as I think of there's this two-day revival going on, I'm wondering, and question goes into my mind, I wonder how many times she went back while Jesus was teaching and said, you've got to come out. You don't understand. People are hearing this teaching like they've never heard. And people are believing. It's not just me. It's others. You need to come. I wonder how many times in that two days she made that journey back and forth to try to bring people out to meet Jesus. I don't know, but I think... I think she's a pretty special lady, one of the most surprising and dynamic leaders that we see within the New Testament. And stop for a second and, and uh, kind of look at the disciples. Again, the disciples, you know, when they pass by her, don't know if they said anything about her or not. The disciples, where did they go? They went into the exact same community that the woman was from, did they not? That's what they were told to do. Go into this town and get some food. So they walked in and saw the same people that this woman went after, but yet, why aren't they grabbing her? Why aren't they begging and pleading for them to come out to the well and hear about Christ? To hear about who Jesus is. I mean, again, remember who this is. These are the disciples. They've been walking with Jesus. They've heard him teach in ways that they'd never heard before. They've seen this Jesus guy do miraculous miracles, more than one. So why aren't they? You see, I, I, one of my concerns with the church today is that, and, and this is why you hear me passionate a lot about a purpose a lot. People say, Dave, you talk about purpose a lot. I do talk about purpose a lot because I think what, one of the things that we have to be so careful is we become so comfortable with Christ in the church. You know, and, and one of my concerns that we see within the church is the church is supposed to come into a community and be a light and affect the community and the culture that it is within. And if we're not careful, the community, the culture can seep in and affect the church. And I think that happens way too many times. Maybe the reason the disciples didn't say a word to this woman walking out, maybe the reason the disciples didn't go in with the passion that this woman did into this community that this woman had went into is because they were Jews and these were Samaritans and the culture said, you hate them. That's what they had been raised with. That's how they've been raised to look at these Samaritans. Have nothing to do with it. They're scum. You don't want anything to do with those people. Don't talk. Okay, we're going to get in, get our food, and get out, and get with Jesus, and not worry about this. I don't know, but I bet it had a strong effect when it came down to that. And, and, and for us, I'm concerned that if we don't understand our purpose, that we can lose our place the same exact way of how we look at people, of how we see people, of how we decide who we are going to accept, who we are going to reach out, who we are going to minister to, who we are going to tell people about Jesus. You know, well, I don't need to speak to that group, or I don't, you know, don't need to understand. For whatever reason, it never crossed their minds to share with them. Yet this woman sees the people that desperately needed to meet the Savior. See, we have no idea what's inside 
of people. We have no idea what's inside of people. And we have no idea how God can use us and how God will use others when we step up. I remember reading, or excuse me, listening to uh, Tony Campolo, who's an author and famous author and speaker. And he gave this illustration once about a recruit that went to training uh, Paris Island. He wanted to become a Marine. And he went in and started going through their basic training and everything. And the problem was he, was he was just a little different, a little off, you know, in how he did things and said things, you know, and, and, and stuff and how he related personally. And, and, of course, you understand a bunch of guys, you know, a bunch of Marines in, in these barracks, you know, uh, they picked on him big time, you know, to the point that actually these other Marines, they wanted nothing to do with him. They didn't even want him to be in the barracks. And he got stuck in these barracks with some very very meanful men, and they, they didn't want him to be there. They wanted him to quit. They wanted him to drop out. They didn't think he was Marine quality, and they picked on him in just all those ways, as you can imagine, and, and that would happen when it came to that. To one time, um, a couple of them came up with a sure idea that they knew that they could just scare the living snots out of him, and would probably get him to jump through a window and maybe even quit what they finally wanted. They were going to take a grenade, and that it was a dud, but they were going to throw it in there and yell, live grenade, live grenade! And they were sure that, like I said, that he would that would be it. He couldn't take that kind of torture anymore and he would leave. So the day came, everybody in the barracks knew what was going to happen and everybody had showed up and was there and, and stuff like that and they threw the grenade in there and did just that, live grenade, live grenade, and to their shock, he jumps on it. And he starts screaming, get out, get out, save yourself, get out. You hear a pin drop. As those other Marines, they froze in stillness and in shame and just looked at him laying on the floor with his grenade. They realized that the one they had scorned was the one ready to lay down his life for them. And my friends, there's so many people in this world the exact same way with Christ. You know, they don't understand. In this world, they don't understand what Christ has done for them. And you have no idea what's inside people. You have no idea the pain that's there. You have no idea how God can use those people. You have no idea, you know, uh, any of that kind of stuff. All you know is we have a purpose. We have a purpose that we're called to go out with the message. And our message, we say, is who is our mission? Who do we take that message to? Simply everyone. And I know, you know, the 150 of us that gather here every, every week, we can't go out to talk to every single person in the world. I understand that, you know. And for some of you, I know when you hear that, it's a lot easier than others. Some of you, not a problem. Some of you, it's a piece of cake. You know, I'm always teasing my wife. We can walk into a room full of 50 people, never ever met them again. When we walk out, they're on our Christmas list. <laughs> you know, they're our new BFFs forever. You know, when it comes to that, if you know my wife, you know what I'm talking about. I love that about her, okay? And now I'm the preacher. I'm the pastor. I'm the, you know, and everything. I walk into that same room. You know where I go? I go back and sit with Mark. Well, Mark's not there. But that's where I go sit in his area, you know. I go sit in the corner quiet and watch people because I'm, I'm really, honestly, I'm not that outgoing. And that I understand how I need to be more outgoing and do those kinds of things, but I, I really am not when it comes to that. You know, that whole extrovert, introvert thing, I'm like right on the scale. I really don't classify one way or the other. I'm kind of like deadline there, <laughs> you know, when it comes to that. So I understand there's some of you that, oh, not a problem. This is a piece of cake. And others of you are like, <laughs> this is a problem, you know. But what I want us to understand first and foremost, that as the opportunities arise for us to share our faith, it's not some duty. I don't want us to look like we have to do this out of guilt. We have this duty that we have to do because we say we're a Christian and, and stuff like that. It should be something we do out of joy, out of delight, you know, because we understand what Jesus Christ has done for us and who Jesus is and how real he is and, and what he wants us to do. And I know many of you might be thinking, well, Dave, I don't have that gift of evangelism, so I'm off the hook on this one, right? No. The lesson that we learn from Jesus and the Samaritan woman is simply this. God has strategically placed you where you're at to reach one or some. God has strategically placed you where you are at to reach one or some. I realize like I said, this woman, she goes back to the town where she's from, and it probably was out of her comfort zone. But yet she felt compelled to go back and share with those that she did life with on a daily basis. No matter how they treated her, 
she felt compelled to go back to these people she did life with on a daily basis. So what does that look like for us? You know, Again, God has intentionally and strategically placed you in your family, in your friendships, in your neighborhood, your workplace, to reach out to those who you're already doing life with daily. And you think, well, how do I know who to reach? You know, I, I, how do I understand? You know, uh, I understand sometimes we forget. And that uh, I, when I was in school, one of the things I was taught and you know was to think of France how many of you ever heard of the country France some of you how many of you ever heard of the country France how many of you ever heard of the country France I'm not letting you off the hook on this one people when it comes down to it sorry I might be a little more passionate you're thinking wow this guy's a nut okay I opened myself up for that one. <laughs> it's okay to raise your hand in church, really, okay? It's okay, Church of Christ, to raise your hand in church. There is a Holy Spirit, and we can... Oh, I'm just teasing, kind of, sort of. But I'm not talking about the country, France. But it can help you remember this. France, what does it stand for? It stands for your friends, your relatives, your acquaintances, your neighbors, your co-workers, if you're at school, your classmates, and keeping an eye on everyone. F-R-A-N-C-E, your friends. Who do you hang around with? Who do you run around with? Your relatives. Didn't get to pick them, but they're still your relatives. You know, they still need to know Jesus, okay? You know, your acquaintances. Who do you know that, you know, whatever that is? Your neighbors that you have around you. People that you work with are your classmates and keeping an eye on them. You know, those are the people that you live and do life with each and every day that you have an opportunity to be that light, you know, for them be that light. And again, I know when you say, Dave, I just don't know. I don't even know where to start. Then let me challenge you to start where I was challenged to start when it came down to when I was in school and hearing this as a terrified young student thinking about going into ministry and what it was going to call because like I said, I'm not as outgoing as sometimes as I am in my life and it might seem to be when it comes to that aspect with it. But, you know, we well, had a professor and he shared this with me, these simple words. He challenged us and he said, this is where you start. You know, a lot of times people say, well, Dave, I talk to God all the time. I pray to God, but he doesn't answer my prayer. This is a prayer that I believe that if you start praying it, you will actually see God answer it. That's how confident I am in this prayer, that God will work, okay? Because I've prayed it many, many times. I know people that have prayed it many, many times, and they had it answered. It's simply this. Lord, I don't ask you for much today, but would you give me your heart for the lost? Lord, I don't ask you for much today. But can you help me see my friends? Can you help me see my relatives, my acquaintances, my neighbors, my coworkers, my classmates? As I look at them, can you help me see them like you do, Jesus? Not like my culture tells me to see them. Not like what my culture says I should view them. Can you help me look at the lost, the people I should do life with each and every day that maybe don't know and don't understand? Can you please help me see them the way that you do? When you start praying that prayer, I believe you'll start fulfilling your purpose because God's going to answer that prayer. God's going to answer that prayer. And the opportunities are going to be there, you know, to share when it comes to that. So I encourage you, post that somewhere where you're brushing your teeth, you can see that prayer, you know. Start praying that prayer when it comes to that aspect. You know, when it comes to saying, hey, God, what, how can I work, how can I fulfill that purpose today? Maybe simply just seeing those around you. Boy, Christ is. The worship team is going to come up here and they're going to continue to allow us to worship this God that has this beautiful, powerful, wonderful blessing of a purpose for each and every one of us. And as we get ready to take time and, and, and to remember, as we get, get ready to celebrate the, the elements that are going to be on the tables around here that, that, that help us remember um, Christ's body that was given for us, his blood that was shed for us, as we take time and remember and give thanks and celebrate on, on what that means for us in our life, I also want you to take time and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. To speak to your heart and, and say, do I understand my mission? Do I understand my message? Am I really living out the purpose for which God has created in that? Do I really look at people the way that Christ does? Or do I look at people the way the culture says? And just let the Holy Spirit talk to you and share with you. And while this time of, and that while, while the worship team, team is singing, when you're ready, you can go to one of the tables and, and serve yourself the elements of, 
partake of the elements. If you can't get back there, just raise your hand. One of our ushers will come around and bring that to you. But also during this time, if you're realizing that, you know, I, I haven't been. I've been looking at people, and I've forgotten how I'm supposed to be out there living my mission. I've forgotten the message that I'm supposed to do. I've forgotten that life's not about me, but all about Christ and what that should look like. And, and you want people praying with you or praying for you. I'm going to be up front. Come on up here. If there's a decision you want to make, you know, whatever, come on up here. And if there's people with me, keep on coming because we have leadership that can be here. But let's go before God right now and just take some time and remember and rejoice and celebrate. Father, I do thank you. I thank you that you're a God that loves us, Lord, and is there for us. And I thank you that you created us all with a purpose. And forgive us when, Lord, we've let other things come in and, and we haven't prioritized that. And we haven't put that in and in, in understood and... In, in, Father God, I have just let life and gotten busy and whatever, Heavenly Father. And, and I thank you that you've believed in this enough to give us this purpose, to give us this calling, to give us this mission, to give us this message. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you believe in us enough for that. And I pray, Father, as we just take this time and remember the gift of your Son, Christ, and remember the sacrifice on the cross, Lord, and, and, and all that that means for us when we turn and give our lives to him. I pray, Father, also your spirit will help us to remember what it means to call ourselves a Christian, a disciple to follow, and help us to look and see, are, are we fulfilling the purpose, Father God? And then I pray for that wisdom that is there. I pray also for that strength to be with us, Lord, the strength to step up and, and start fulfilling that purpose today, Lord. I thank you that we could gather together corporately in this community, this family we call Williamsville Christian Church, and come in and celebrate and worship and, and laugh and, and sing and just... Be in your presence, Father God. Now as we take this time to remember and to reflect, Father, may your spirit speak to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.